Good evening and welcome to the latest in the group of seminars from the barristers in the employment group at 42 Bedford Row. We are here to liven up your lockdown and drag you away from homeschooling, endless Teams meetings or Netflix to lead us applicable. My name is Gillian Crew, and as I mentioned, I'm one of the employment barristers in Chambers. We have a very strong team of some 35 barristers who are primed and ready to take on your employment instructions at any time. I'm here today to talk to you about whistleblowing claims. Whistleblowing claims, particularly in the times of COVID, with a normal disclaimer that nothing that I can say should be relied upon as legal advice. That generally comes with a briefing attached, I'm afraid. Hopefully, I'm not just talking to myself on this webinar. So if you're here, thank you very much for joining and for keeping me company. Please feel free to put any questions that you may have arising out of this topic on the Q&A or in the chat, and I'll hope to answer them at the end of this session. Um, please bear with me if I need to share my screen to um, show you the PowerPoint slides, as it may go horribly wrong. But never fear that a handout will be provided and sent to you all after this talk in the event of speaker tech incompetence. So um, dealing with whistleblowing um, claims. Whistleblowing claims have very much become a regular part of the employment law arsenal. And in my experience anyway, they often feel like a bit of a kitchen sink claim. This webinar is going to focus on the applicable law, how to deal with such claims that may arise during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not going to focus on section 44 or section 100 of the ERA, so um, serious and imminent health and safety um, cases of detriments and dismissals. Those have been widely covered elsewhere and quite frankly deserve a seminar on, and are a topic in themselves. I intend to look at the law in relation to whistleblowing claims and then consider some of the scenarios that I've come across during the, um, the pandemic and also claims that may arise as a result of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. So let's start at the beginning, a very good place to start. So the, the Public Interest in Disclosure Act 1998, PEDA, as we lovingly know, it came into force in the 2nd of July 1999. It's a very short act of Parliament and consists entirely of amending provisions to the ERA, um, which provides the framework that we love and know as the whistle for whistleblowing claims. It was a short act of Parliament. Um, it's interesting historically because it was actually introduced as a private member's bill. Um, but it has some big ideas. It was introduced in the light of disasters that we will all recall, like the Brooker Ferry disaster, the Clapham tra train disaster, BCCI and um, Matrix Churchill um, business problems as well. All of these were events that, um, when looked at and analysed, um, were revealed to be events where blowing the whistle may prevent the actual disaster occurring, particularly in relation to the Zeebrugger ferry disaster, which we'll all recall occurred when the um, ferry left the harbour with the doors open. So PEDA, um, the long title gives an uh, idea of what the 1998, 1998 actually set out to do. And it says as follows, it's an act to protect individuals who make certain disclosures of information in the public interest to allow such individuals to bring actions in respect of victimisation and for connected purposes. So looking at even at that description, we will see a couple of familiar um, concepts rearing ahead from the very beginning. So disclosure of information in the public interest. So the 1998 Act set in place the framework that we know within the ERA um, and it introduced specific rights into the ERA. So the right not to suffer a detriment for making a protected disclosure within Section 47B, the right not to be unfairly dismissed for making such a disclosure, Section 103A of the ERA, and following some changes, the right not to be subject to a detriment by colleagues for making a protected disclosure, Section 47B1A. The need for um, PEDA hasn't gone away. Um, for example, when you think about the, what the recent decades have shown us and the Me Too movement, so perhaps abuse by high-profile celebrities may have been stopped earlier if we're stopping blown. So thinking of the Jimmy Savile case, Harvey Weinstein, and indeed over the last decade or so, whistleblowers themselves have become very well known. I'm thinking of people like Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, even Julian Assange. So, so the need for whistleblowers and the purpose that they perform in society is still very much with us today. Let's have a look at the present, the statutory framework, um, to remind us where the framework in which our claims for 
um, whistleblowing claims arise. So section 43B, disclosures qualifying for protection. A qualifying disclosure means any disclosure of information, which in the reasonable belief of the worker making that disclosure, as recently amended, is made in the public interest and tends to show one of the following. Either that A, a criminal offence has been committed, is being committed or is likely to be committed. B, this person has, has failed or is likely to fail in complying with any legal obligation. C, a miscarriage of justice has occurred. D, health or safety of an individual has been, is being or is likely to be endangered. E, that the environment is being or is likely to be damaged. F, that information tending to show that any of the other previous paragraphs um, are are being or is likely to be deliberately concealed. Now, in terms of COVID claims, it seems to me that the most pertinent paragraphs are going to be um, subparagraph A, criminal offence has been committed, it's been committed or it's likely to be committed, B, failing to comply with a legal obligation, which obviously in, in most whistleblowing claims is the ones that um, tend to be phrased in that respect, and also D, health and safety of any individual has been or is likely to be endangered. So that's the what. Turning to by whom when it comes to making a whistleblowing claim. The protection applies under section 233 of the year eight to workers, so it's a wide definition. Um, we know from case law that cases have extended the protection for whistleblowers to various individuals. So for example, um, the definition now includes a member of an LLP. See the case of Clyde Co and Bates van Winkelhoff from 2014. 2020, even judges can now avail themselves of the protection as it was found necessary to interpret the ERA in a manner that gave them protection for whistleblowing, despite the lack of a necessary contractual relationship. And the reason for doing that was to do otherwise would amount to discrimination on grounds of status in violation of Article 14 of the ECHR for office holders. And that is the important case of Gillen and Ministry of Justice. However, it doesn't help everybody. So the poor rector of the Bishop of Worcester's diocese was found not to have a contract and therefore not to be a worker, see the case of Sharp and the Bishop of Worcester. So that's the who. Um, clearly, the policy behind it was to extend the who and to the largest number of group of persons possible. So as many people in society as possible be in a position to be blow the whistle and also to be protected were they to do so. The battleground, though, really is or has been in the recent years over the what. What is the protected disclosure? Disclosure of information versus opinion or versus an allegation. And there has, as we are aware, of course, been much case law on this matter. The useful case of Geddes and Cavendish Munro is the one that I still turn to um, when dealing with this matters. The EAT held in that case that there must be a disclosure of information rather than simply making an allegation. And there's a distinction between to be drawn between communicating an information, information and making an allegation. So in that case, there was a solicitor's letter um, alleging that their client shareholder had been unfairly prejudiced by the company. And the EAT said this. Further, the ordinary meaning of giving information is conveying a fax. In the course of the hearing before us, a hypothetical case was advanced regarding communication information about the state of a hospital very pertinent to us um, in the COVID pandemic. Communicating information would be the wards have not been cleaned for the past two weeks. Yesterday, sharps are left lying around. Contrasted with that would be a statement that says you are not complying with health and safety requirements. In our view, that would be an allegation, not an information. In the employment context, an employee may complain to the employer that if they are not going to be treated better, they will resign and claim constructive unfair dismissal. Assume that the employer, having received that outline of the employee's position from him or her, then dismisses the employee. In our judgment, that dismissal does not follow from any disclosure of information. It follows from a statement of the employee's position. So the um, clear takeaway point from Geddold is that information, facts, must be conveyed. And that was made um, 
good, if you excuse the pun, in the case of good and Marks and Spencers. That was the case about proposed change to enhanced redundancy payment scheme. The EAT held that the mere expression of an adverse opinion, in this case that uh, Mr Good was disgusted with the proposals about, from his employer, could not amount to the conveying of information. However, after those two cases, things got a little bit more murky. Um, what, the position that we're really left with is one that we often find ourselves in employment tribunal. In other words, it depends on all of the circumstances on the case, that it is going to be a matter of fact in each particular case, whether there is an allegation or whether there is disclosure of information. The following cases that I'm going to refer to um, make good the proposition that in reality it's often not so simple as to say, well, this is information, this is an allegation. Often the two go hand in hand together. Uh, the first case that I'm going to look at is the case of in the notes is Western Union Payment Service and Anastasia. And the EAT looked again at Cavendish, Monroe and Good, and they um, made that very point that I've just made. The distinction can be a fine one to draw, and one can envisage circumstances in which the statement of a position could involve the disclosure of information and vice versa. The assessment as to whether there have been a disclosure of information in particular cases will always be fact sensitive. In other words, it's going to depend on what's happening in a particular case. Um, case of Kilrain and Lundborough of Wandsworth. The Court of Appeal approved the EAT's um, decision holding that the tribunal had been justified in rejecting the claims of, of the detriment claims as a result of making a protected disclosure and applying Cavendish Monroe, they stated. I would caution some care in the application of the principles arising out of Cavendish Monroe. The dichotomy between information and allegation is not one that is made by the statute itself. It would be a pity if tribunals were too easily seduced into asking whether it was one or the other, when reality and experience suggest that very often information and allegation are intertwined. The decision is not decided by whether a given phrase or a paragraph is one and or rather the other, but this be determined in the light of the statute. The question is simply whether it is a disclosure of information. Well, that's not really very helpful um, because, of course, we know that that's what it says it's about. But I think what the Court of Appeal was underlying is that it's about looking at all of the circumstances of the case and it's fact specific as to whether on the particular circumstances of that case, there's been a disclosure of information or simply the making of an allegation or the expression of an adverse opinion. Another interesting case um, for the EAT on, on this was the case of IGA Securities. Um, in that case, the um, EAT held it wasn't sufficient to point out to the employer that the employee believed that the actions were um, morally wrong. This was a case where the um, employee had stated it was wrong for her manager to trade from her personal designated computer without making it clear that she, the employee, was not the person making the trade. The EAT held that if the statement had stopped there, it might have been no more than an allegation of wrongdoing. However, the employee had gone on to tell her manager what her clients had thought of this bit of the, of the behaviour. So that was new information. And that, that was an example where the situation of allegation and information were intertwined and Kilrain applied. So the tribunal had not erred in the facts of that particular case in concluding that the employee had disclosed information within the meaning of section 43B. So in other words, we get back to it all depends on the circumstances of the case. Um, allegations and disclosure of information can often be intertwined, but it seems to me that the sensible and pragmatic advice has to be, if in doubt, treat as a protected disclosure, because then you're not going to be criticised um, for doing so by the tribunal subsequently. As we know from previous case law, the actual legal obligation itself when it comes to protected disclosure doesn't even have to exist. So in the case of Babula, um, the whistleblower thought that the legal obligation existed, um, and this was a complaint where an American lecturer was told by his students that his predecessor divided the class into Islamic and non-Islamic students, had talked about wanting a September 11th incident to occur in London. Um, he believed that this was a threat to national security and a threat to incite racial hatred um, and contacted the CIA and the FBI and informed his college that he'd done so. The um, disclosure led to a series of acts which caused him to resign and claim constructive unfair dismissal on the grounds of making protective disclosure. 
The claim was struck out as having no reasonable prospect of success on the basis that the fact showed an incitement to religious, not racial hatred, um, but that was overturned on the basis that it didn't need for the actual legal obligation to have existed at the time. So to whom? I can deal with this fairly quickly. Um, the qualifying disclosure must be made of a category of persons specified under section 43. So disclosure to the employer, section 43C1, a disclosure to a person responsible for the relevant failure, disclosure to a legal advisor, disclosure to a minister, minister of the Crown, disclosure to a prescribed person, section 43F. External disclosure in cases not listed above, only if the worker reasonably believes the information to be substantially true, doesn't make the disclosure for purposes of personal gain, and it's reasonable to make the disclosure, or in cases of exceptionally serious failings under section 43H to the press. Um, as I mentioned it earlier, the statutory framework provides for Section 47B not to be subject to a detriment and not to be dismissed, um, Section 103A. I've included those sections in the notes. I think we're familiar with um, them, so I won't go through them at this time, but they will be within the notes um, for us to look at. So um, what then happened in 2013, we know that there were amendments and the public interest was explicitly reinserted into section 43B. Um, why was this? Um, in 2013, it was felt that this was going to stem the tide of kitchen sink type whistleblowing claims that I referred to uh, concerning the individual's contract of employment. This was because of the case of Parkins and Sodico from 2002, uh, in which it was held that the breach of an individual's contract of employment could amount to a breach of a legal obligation. What actually went wrong? Well, this resulted um, in claims where, which were often more of a constructive unfair dismissal type claim, being brought as a whistleblowing or being dressed up as a whistleblowing claim. So in other words, an employee was saying to the employer, I think you're being horrible to me because of X, Y, and Z, and was dressing this up and, and subsequently was dressing this up as a whistleblowing claim and being able to normally um, bring a automatic unfair dismissal claim when they didn't have the right to bring, for example, the unfair dismissal claim. So the answer that um, the amendments brought was to introduce the public interest. Now, of course, flashback to 1998, 1999, and we'll recall from the title of PETA that it was originally in there, that the idea of the whistleblowing was only um, designed for protection for disclosures, disclosures of information made in the public interest. So in many ways, it was simply underlining the original purpose of the whistleblowing provisions. So the requirement was inserted into section 43b that the worker must reasonably believe that disclosures is made in the public interest. That was thought that was going to be the solution to the kitchen sink type claims. Was it? Was it egg? Of course it wasn't. Um, as was um, predicted at the time, post-2013 case law has shown that this test is um, relatively easily overcome and that the bar for um, public interest test is a relatively low one. The key case for us to um, consider, which has gone up, to, which went all the way up to the Court of Appeal level, is that of Chesterton Global Limited and Nur Mohammed. In that case, the Court of Appeal considered the public interest test. Mr. Nur Mohammed alleged that Chesterton's, obviously the well known um, national estate agency firm, were manipulating its accounts, which was affecting his bonus and commission of um, not just him, but 100 senior managers. And he made disclosures about this to Chesterton's and then complained about his treatment. The Court of Appeal held that the essential point um, of the public interest test is that the disclosure needs to serve a wider interest than the private or the personal interest of the worker making the disclosure, but it's not a numerical decision. So the relevant factors to be weighed in the tribunal's analysis include the numbers in the affected group, the nature of the interests affected, and the extent to which they are affected, the nature of the wrongdoing being alleged and the identity of the alleged wrongdoer. The number of people sharing the interest is not of itself determinative, such that the fact that at least one other person shared the interest was insufficient in itself to convert it to a matter of public interest, but isn't necessarily going to stop it. And conversely, it's wrong to say that simply because it affects a large number of people um, whose interests are served by the disclosure of the breach of uh, the alleged breach, um, that doesn't mean that it cannot convert a personal interest into a public interest. 
nor would a public interest merely be a public interest because it serves a number of people as well as particular workers. So starting back from that, the test, uh, we now know the test is not numerical. It depends on the character of the interest served. Again, all of the circumstances need to be considered, the numbers affected, and in particular, the nature of the interest affected and its importance, whether the matter is complained of was deliberate and the identity of the wrongdoer. Another important case was that of Under, Underwood and Wincanton PLC. Uh, that was a dismissal case um, looked at by the EAT. Mr Underwood was dismissed after he made disclosures together with his colleagues to his employer about the unfair distribution of overtime work. He claimed that he suffered a detriment and then was automatically unfairly dismissed because he made a protected disclosure. The tribunal at that point struck out the claim holding that the public interest element wasn't present, the complaint, although the complaint was made by several workers who had a shared grievance about an aspect of their particular employment contracts. The EAT held that that interpretation was too narrow. Um, they were wrong to conclude that the public interest element could not be met where the disclosure concerned um, a small number of employees of the same em employer. The EAT said this, to my mind, what leaps on the page is firstly the importance of the matter being assessed in a factual context. Secondly, the fact that the EAT has held that a public interest requirement may be met by a relatively small group of persons. And thirdly, that those persons may constitute employees of the same employer who have the same interest in the matter as they are raised as raised by the claimant personally. The other case that I find is of interest is that of MenCat, but again, this was a strikeout case. Um, and this appears, this is a good example of showing how the bar of the public interest test is relatively low. Um, and this perhaps is a claim where on first blush, it does look like the kitchen sink type claims. Uh, this was a case where the claim was, uh, the employee's claim was struck out at preliminary hearing without hearing any evidence. Um, her disclosures were in fact complaints about cramped working conditions that she was suffering and she uh, said that that was a danger to health and safety and in particular that aggravated an existing knee injury. She stated that she reasonably believed that disclosures were made in the public interest um, because her former employer was a charity and the public should know how it was treating its employees. The EAT that held that the tribunal had erred and that they failed to take the employee's facts at the highest and whilst her complaints and her, protect, her alleged protected disclosures were about her own predicament. She did assert the belief that others might be affected by the same working conditions. And it was reasonably arguable that an employee might consider health and safety complaints to be made in the wider of interests of employees generally, even if they are the principal person um, affected. In particular, um, such a question should not have been addressed without the hearing of evidence. It seems to me that that's the key point here, that that was a strikeout case. Bearing in mind that whistleblowing claims are more akin to victimisation discrimination, it was um, quite right to conclude that it was wrong that such a claim should have been struck out without hearing any evidence on it. So it seems to me the case of Morgan is an example of, um, shows how low the bar can sometimes be in establishing a public interest. So dealing with the causation and standard of proof briefly, um, as we know, there is a difference between the tests to be applied uh, for detriment claims and dismissal. For the detriment claims in Section 47B, it's whether the protected disclosure is a material factor in the um, treatment of the, of the worker or the employee. Whereas for automatic unfair dismissal cases, the protected disclosure must be the sole or principal reason and the cases for that are, of course, they're fabulously named Feckett and others, and NHS Manchester, and also Salisbury NHS Trust and, and Wyeth. Um, in the Wyeth case, the EAT do set out a health summary of the difference of uh, approach between the detriment claim and the unfair dismissal claim. They have this to say. Um, a shorthand way of describing the difference is to say the detriment protection mirrors the language of discrimination protection, whereas section 103A mirrors that of unfair dismissal. The distinction was made more fully by Elias in um, Feckett and others and NHS Manchester. In considering the correct approach for section 47B purposes, Elias opined as follows in paragraph 43. Liability arises if the protected disclosure is a material factor in the employee's decision to subject the claimant to a detrimental act. Ingen, Ingen and Wong, is not strictly applicable 
applicable here since it has an EU context. However, the reasoning which has informed the EU analysis is that unlawful discriminatory considerations should not be tolerated and ought not to have any influence on an employee, employer's decision. In my judgment, that principle is equally applicable where the objective is to protect whistleblowers, particularly given the public interest in ensuring that they are not discouraged from coming forward to highlight potential wrongdoing. Turning then to protection against dismissal, he continued, I accept that this creates an anomaly with the situation in unfair dismissal, where the protected disclosure must be the sole or the principal reason before the dismissal is deemed to be automatically unfair. However, it seems to me this is simply a result of placing dismissal for this particular reason into the general run of unfair dismissal law. As Mummery LJ cautioned in Kuzel and Roche Products Limited, a paragraph 48 in the context of a protected disclosure claim. Unfair dismissal and discrimination on specific prohibited grounds are, however, different causes of action. The statutory structure of the unfair dismissal legislation is so different from that of discrimination legislation that an attempt at cross-fertilisation or legal transplants runs the risk of complicating rather than clarifying the legal uh, concepts. And then finally, from that case, um, when it comes to the automatic unfair dismissal, um, it was highlighted. In short, whereas the but-for test may be appropriate in criterion cases, it is the reason why question which prevails in circumstances where the employee's mental processes, conscious or subconscious, are an issue. The latter question arises in the present case. So just dealing with some practical guidance on the approach um, for whistleblowing claims, I always turn to the case of Black Bay Ventures, and I've set it out in my notes, but it's very helpful guidance as the approach that should be taken by tribunals when considering whistleblowing claims. And it says as following, it may be helpful if we suggest the approach that should be taken by employment tribunals considering claims by employees for victimization of having made protected disclosures. Each disclosure should be identified by reference to date and content. Secondly, the alleged failure or likely failure to comply with a legal obligation or matter giving rise to health and safety of an individual um, should be identified. Thirdly, the basis on which the disclosure is said to be protected and qualifying should be addressed. Each failure or likely failure should be separately identified. Five, save in obvious cases, if the breach of obligation is asserted, the source of that obligation should be identified and capable of verification by reference, for example, to statute or regulation. Six, the tribunal should then determine whether or not the claimant had a reasonable belief under section 43B under the old law or under the new law, whether the disclosure was made in the public interest. Seven, where it is alleged that the claim to suffer a detriment short of dismissal is necessary to identify the detriment in question and whether the, and where relevant the date of the act or the relevant failure to act relied upon. Particularly important in case of deliberate failure to act because unless the deliberate failure of act can be ascertained, the failure of the respondent to act is deemed to take place when the period expires might reasonably have expected to do the failed act. And the tribunal under the old law should then determine whether the claimant acted in good faith and under the new law, whether the disclosure was made in public interest. So turning to whistleblowing in the times of COVID, we find ourselves yet again in another lockdown. I think we're at lockdown four, could be lockdown 10, who knows? Um, we find ourselves at a time when the vaccine program is thankfully going well for the vulnerable groups, but it's nowhere near complete. Homeschooling uh, is very much a, a thing that remains with us. Working from home is very much how many of us are carrying out our day-to-day -day lives. But I think it's fair to say our minds are turning to a way out as spring comes closely. And we are hoping that at some point we'll be able to return to some sort of normality and an end to working from home for those of us that choose. Um, and vaccinations will, of course, be one way that that will be achieved. But another way is that whistleblowing claims are likely to help and will come into their own and they're likely to increase as um, we attempt to get back to some sort of normality. Although, of course, big city firms are not looking forward to ending working from home until some the end of August, the end of um, autumn of 2021, if at all, that's not going to be the reality for many other sectors. So thinking of care workers, bus drivers, NHS staff, uh, workers and other frontline staff um, who are not able to work from home. There are going to be many examples where whistleblowing that described above are a useful tool um, for concerns arising out of either employers' handling of the pandemic, of the COVID pandemic, or uh, a worker's concern that the workplace is not COVID secure insofar as any workplace can be. As we search for a way out of our current lockdown, whistleblowing claims are going to increase, in my view. Uh, one of the obvious reasons for that is if you're not an employee, 
you cannot rely upon section 44 and section 100 the ERA which are as it were the nuclear buttons uh, for the serious imminent health and safety cases if you have a serious concern but you can use the normal whistleblowing provisions particularly um, health and safety being endangered and you can rely upon protection under section 47b not to be subject to a detriment and not to be dismissed under section 103a. Such protected disclosures could go as far as including a refusal to attend work altogether with complaint, if the complaint is about work conditions, if it complies with the requirements of Section 43B and disclosure of information has occurred. And I do say could, uh, because such claims do fall more naturally within Section 44 or Section 100 of the ERA, the serious and imminent cases, but could be brought in the appropriate case under Section 43B. So, Certainly from my experience um, since March 2020, um, claims for whistleblowing claims, both detriments and dismissals, likely to fall with it broadly within three sort of categories that we can divide them into. Firstly, protected disclosures that um, centre on the employer's conduct during the pandemic. So, for example, then that might be an allegation of furlough fraud, such as asking a furloughed employee to work whilst on furlough. Because of course we'll recall that under the coronavirus um, job retention scheme the employee can who is furloughed cannot work they might be able to do some voluntary work they might be able to do some training they might be able to work if their contract of employment permits them for another employer but they cannot be used by the employer for work uh, it seems to me that asking a furloughed employee to work whilst on furlough could amount to a fraud it could amount to a breach of the legal obligations under the coronavirus job retention scheme and it could therefore fall with under and a disclosure of information about the same could fall therefore within section 43b 1a criminal offence has been committed or 1b breach of a legal obligation uh, such claims may lead of course to dismissal claims uh, for example that the individual who made the complaint was subsequently found themselves to be dismissed for redundancy. Now, of course, redundancy may be a potentially fair reason. Um, and there is nothing unusual in a employee saying, well, that wasn't actually, although the, there was a redundancy situation, um, although redundancy is potentially fair, that wasn't the actual genuine reason why I was dismissed. I was dismissed for another reason. It's a sham. And in this particular case, that would be that the protected disclosures were the real reason. The tribunal will have to look at the motivation and the causation behind the decision to dismiss that particular individual. There is nothing un unusual about the um, tribunal having to do that. I've already seen quite a few of these sort of cases being started in the tribunal. I'm going to say quite a few. I would certainly say more than on one hand, um, more than I could count on one hand. Um, but of course, these cases are going to take a while before we start to see a result from them, even at first instance, particularly given the backlog of um, cases that we are dealing with in the tribunal system. Now, of course, it's quite common at the moment for cases to be listed towards the end of 2021 and indeed into 2022, if they are cases of five days or more. So we're going to be waiting some time until we see the results of um, those sort of cases that fall within the first category of um, whistleblowing claims, protected disclosures about the employee's conduct, of course, wait even longer before we might get an appellate decision. The second broad category of cases seems to me is protected disclosures about the workplace, about the workplace not being COVID secure. So, for example, for um, that might include a lack of hand washing facilities or a lack of social distancing um, or perhaps even a quarantine breach um, by a particular employee. It is likely that the vast majority, certainly at the moment, the vast majority of the workforce, once we get to the end, hopefully soon, of this particular work, of this particular lockdown, will not be eligible for the first rounds of COVID vaccinations. Although I do see some reports in the, vac in the mainstream media of the government attempting to get certainly the first round of vaccinations done um, by the summer. So the obligation will still remain on employee employers who want to bring employees back into the work workplace and who do not want them to continue to work from home um, to be providing a safe system of work insofar as they can, including the carrying out of risk assessments and indeed the carrying out of reviews of risk assessments. The relevant breach of legal obligations are going to be those that of the employers contained 
um, within the Management of Health and Safety Work Regulations 1999. Those include, of course, the important um, obligations to provide a safe system of work in Regulation 4, duty to risk assess and provide a safe system of work, and indeed the duty to review your risk assessments, providing the safe system of work within Regulation 3. So I remind myself, and indeed the respondent employers amongst us, that this is a duty to review risk assessments, not simply to have a one, a one time um, or one size fits all risk assessment. So, for example, it seems to me that relevant circumstances which would lead to review would, of course, be the recent lockdown. Also, the new variants, um, the South African variants, the Brazilian variants, of course, may cause an employer to review their risk assessment to see if they are suitably robust. Can anything more be reasonably done? So it seems to me that concerns about um, the COVID secureness of the workplace are likely to fall within Section 43B1D, health and safety of any individual has been or likely to be endangered or indeed, as a breach of a legal obligation under the management of health and safety at work regulations. I also mentioned the case of a protected disclosure that is made about a particular employee who is, for example, perhaps has come back, if somebody has been away, um, has come back and has failed to quarantine. That is also something that might, that uh, a claim might be, a protected disclosure claim might be based upon. That probably falls within the third category of, of cases as well. Protected disclosures arising out of the employee's, the employee's actions and the employee's particular circumstances. Um, that might, for example, as I've just referenced, include a protected disclosure about a, an employee who is um, breaching quarantine or breaching self-isolation. It may include um, a protected disclosure made by a shielding clinically vulnerable person who says that they're disabled and may not be willing to return to the workplace once lockdown is lifted and may be alleging a failure to make reasonable adjustments if an employer is requiring them to return to work. Or it may perhaps be an employee who will not take COVID-19 vaccination because of health and safety concern. And the employer wants all employees to be vaccinated. That's something I'm going to have a look at in a moment under the um, discussion of no jab, no job. Are those circumstances in those three categories that we've just looked at, are they going to pass the public interest test? In my view, yes, they are, um, potentially, depending on the, the, the facts of each particular case. As we know from the above case law that we've looked at, it's a relatively low bar. So it is arguably in the public interest to know which well-known companies have been committing furlough fraud. Um, likewise, it is arguably in the public interest to know which companies are not providing self safe workplaces for their employees. So what can an, em an employer do in such circumstances to defend themselves? Well, it seems to be the very simple step that, you, we can, that all employers can take is to assume that any complaint that they receive may retrospectively be treated as a protected disclosure and treated accordingly. I say that anecdotally from my own experience because I've yet to find um, when it comes to analysing the fact specifics of a particular case that a tribunal, if they are so minded, cannot find um, a particular part of an alleged disclosure will amount to protected disclosure. So it seems to me that a respondent employer is going to put themselves in a stronger position if they treat any complaint received as potentially a protected disclosure. So what does that mean? That means that the complaint should be dealt with fairly and in accordance with procedure. Well, of course, we would hope that our clients would be doing that in any event, but um, we know from our own experience that that is not always the case. Most importantly, to ensure that there is contemporaneous paper trail of the response to the protected disclosure from the employer, any actions that flow from it, um, so that should it go further, the respondent kind of employer will be able to explain to the tribunal, look, this is the reasons for the actions that were taken, and this is why the actions were taken. But when it comes down to it, the, the strongest thing that a respondent employer can do is to actually shore up their position on the reason why for the treatment. Because when all of the fighting and the shouting is done, in my experience, um, whistleblowing claims um, are generally won or lost on causation, irrespective of what is said about the protected, whether it is a protected disclosure or not. So therefore, it is important that we always have a paper trail showing the reason for the treatment, the reason why. Preferably one that's non-discriminatory, non-whistleblowing related. Um, 
particularly in cases where we're looking at um, serious allegations, for example, of furlough fraud and consequences. So, for example, a dismissal that might follow uh, an employee making an allegation of furlough fraud. If it can be shown that the um, employee was not selected and dismissed for redundancy because of the protected disclosure, but that the genuine redundancy was applied, that the criteria were objectively and fairly applied to the employee, then of course that is going to be the um, respondent employee getting out of potentially a very sticky wicket. In terms of the second category of cases, so the COVID uh, workplace type cases, the best approach has got to be partnership working, as much as I hate that term, with employees about any return to the workplace and about the steps put in place to ensure that as far as possible, the workplace is COVID secure. So share risk assessments and the plans to make the, any office or workplace as secure as possible. Invite comments, um, put in place consultation with employees and workers and listen to those comments and adopt so far as possible any um, comments that are made because often employees and workers can come up with something that an employer just cannot see um, because of, you simply can't see the, the wood for the trees anymore. So in terms of the third case, so the employee's particular circumstances and protected disclosures rising out, rising out of, the, of those, the best advice, of, of course, has got to be avoid getting in that situation, if at all possible. If someone is clinically vulnerable, um, they are, of course, likely to be disabled. So the sensible advice in those circumstances, of course, is not to be forcing anybody to come back to the office, but to continue remote working. Um, that is perhaps the one upside of the pandemic has shown us that it is possible in many more areas and in many more sectors than we thought um, previously for home working to be effective and um, to be considered. I wanted, before I finish this talk, to discuss the no jab, no job. I see again that Pimlico plumbers were grabbing the headlines again. Um, this is a rather controversial situation, is it not? No jab, no job scenario. Um, it's fair to say, I think, for all of us, that vaccines are regarded by everybody as an important way out of this cycle of lockdown that we seem to be in, uh, an important way to return to some sort of normality. But then equally important is an individual's right to medical autonomy. It's going to be a very brave employer, in my view, that's going to risk putting in place a no jab, no job policy because there are many legitimate reasons why a particular group may not want to take up a vaccine. And it seems to me that such a policy, although it could be phrased in such a way as to be a reasonable management instruction, is something that is um, highly likely to be indirectly discriminatory to a group or groups um, in the workplace. So I'm thinking the affected groups, for example, might include disabled groups. Um, so those that have severe anaphylactic shock, they may not be um, in a position to take up the vaccines at this stage or may be medically advised not to. Pregnant women, it is still unclear as to the effect of, um, of a vaccine for pregnant women. Even religious belief or race, because there do seem to be anecdotal stories of misinformation being shared in different communities, for example, that the vaccine contains pork, which um, may result in a slower uptake in the vaccine in certain sectors. And there may be those that simply do not fall necessarily within groups that share a protected characteristic, but just have legitimate concerns about the vaccine being relatively untested and about the longer term side effects not yet being known. So, yes, you could, in theory, parcel a no jab, no job um, and word it in such a way as to make it a reasonable management request and dismissal could potentially follow. But you would be, in my view, a very brave employer to be the first employer to do that. And why would you risk potentially alienating your workforce by doing that? Particularly when um, further food for thought is that there are more proportionate steps that would interfere less with an individual's human rights. Um, for example, of course, the concerns are, um, ongoing concerns will be of where either employees or workers are attending premises where there are vulnerable persons, um, such as care homes or hospitals. A more proportionate step might, of course, be requiring negative COVID tests um, to be undertaken. So I see those headlines um, in relation to no jab, no job. I don't see that it's a uh, realistic policy for many to employers to take at this stage in time, particularly not for, um, if not just for the one practical reason. At the moment, the vaccinations is being 
are, are being carried out by the government and the NHS. If an employer cannot actually police the um, policy that's putting in place, it's not really worth the paper that it's written on. So it is um, my advice, my pragmatic advice, Pete, that the employers at this stage certainly should be looking at making their um, workplaces as COVID secure as possible and actually looking at what policies they can implement and actually can enforce which are within their power rather than those at this stage that they cannot um, or put it shortly if Pimico plumbers want to be the first one to put in such a uh, policy let them do it don't do it yourself unless you want to be um, facing a claim for indirect discrimination. So um, if you're an employee and you bring a claim for uh, then you've been dismissed and you say it's because of your the sole principal reason was actually your protected disclosure. Um, that is, of course, a gateway claim for uh, interim relief and is an advantage for employee, employees. I would recommend um, very strongly my colleague Cass' marvellous talk on interim relief, which is also available on 42 Bedford Ray's YouTube channel for you to listen to and watch, which will tell you everything you need to know about making those applications. But in short, um, interim relief only applies to those that are employees and they must apply within seven days of being dismissed. That gives respondent employers very little time to get their act together, um, but they should endeavour to present as much evidence as possible to show that the dismissal was not for a non protected, uh, not for the protected disclosure, but to establish what the non discriminatory, non whistleblowing reason was. Um, the response there is some good news for the respondents is that the Taplin test, which has to be satisfied in relation to interim relief applications, um, is a higher one. Um, it is the employee must show pretty good prospects of success. It's not simply more likely than not 51%. Um, if an employee is successful, that means that they could be reinstated or re-engaged, or they're going to be paid by the, res the respondent employer until the, the hearing, which, as we know, these days could be the end of 2021 into 2022. So clearly, it's a very valuable advantage for employees. What can an employer do about it? Well, um, Catherine had talked, posits the possibility that at the moment that you could if you are placed in that invidious position, you could, of course, put uh, you could potentially put that employee on furlough. That's obviously only going to work until 2021. And you could in the meantime find until April 2021 when the extension of the scheme ends, you could indeed find yourself with a very high bill um, if not. One option, of course, um, as it, that is available to employers that even if a protected disclosure does appear to be a material factor in either detriment or dismissal, the employer can still try and rely upon separability arguments to say it wasn't actually a protected disclosure, but the manner of the disclosure was um, rather than the disclosure itself. And I've referred in my notes to the cases of Martin and Devonshire's um, solicitors and also the Paniatu case and in the Martin and Devish's case the EAT held that there will be cases where the employee has dismissed an employee the employer has dismissed an employee in response to the, doing the protected act but it was some feature that was separable from the protected act itself and um, the EAT said this, we prefer to approach the question first as one of principle and without reference to the complex case law that's developed in this area. The question in any claim of victimisation is what was the reason that the respondent did the act complained of? If it was wholly or in the substantial part that the claimant had done a protected act, the employer is liable for victimisation. And if not, not in our view, there will, be, there will in principle be cases where an employee, employer has dismissed an employee in response to doing a protected act, but where he can say as a matter of common sense and common justice that the reason for the dismissal was not the complaint, but some feature of which can be properly treated as separable. The most straightforward example being where the reason relied upon is the manner of the complaint. Um, in Woodhouse and West North West Homes, the EAT declined to follow Martin. They warned that the distinctions between complaints and the manner of making complaints should only be drawn in clear cases, uh, which on the facts of that particular case, the appeal fell short of. And the EAT said that those circumstances should be exceptional. Um, Paniatu was a case where Miss Paniatu had become completely unmanageable. And the EAT shifted away from the Woodhouse approach um, and found that there was a distinction between the 
in the facts of that particular case, the disclosure of the information and the manner in which it was disclosed. However, I would urge respondent employers to be, as I said, to take note of the fact that EAT describes separability arguments as successful in exceptional circumstances. The separability argument is not a rogues charter, it's the exception and not the rule. Now I've come to the end of the matters that I wanted to talk about. I hope it's been useful to explore a little bit and to discuss whistleblowing claims in the times of COVID. I think I was simply concluded where I started by saying that, that whistleblowing claims are potentially an important weapon in employ, employment lawyers' arsenal at this time. And although decided levels um, at appellate level are going to take some time to um, come out because of the backlog in tribunal cases. In my view, the detriment claims and the dismissal claims arising out of the COVID pandemic are going to be an important tool to be used and we're going to see more of them in the future. Thank you very much for listening. I'm now going to have a look at the questions that we have and um, see if we have time to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for putting up with me waffling on about whistleblowing for so long. I am very um, conscious of the fact that I only have an hour for this Zoom webinar and I've only got a few minutes left, but I do just want to turn to some of um, the questions that you've been putting in, which have been really interesting. And one's come in from Caroline, which um, deals with the last part of the talk, um, it seems to me. This is about where what to do if your employee is essentially raising COVID-19 um, health and safety concerns, but vexatiously. Um, so um, in those circumstances, would it be where the employer can show that there is no substance or truth in the allegations? Would it be um, proper or in those, reasonable in those circumstances for the employer either to instigate some sort of disciplinary action um, or add it to um, existing disciplinary actions and potentially add it to the reasons for dismissal. Now, um, on the face of it, that is something that sounds like it could amount to a detriment and possibly to a um, automatic unfair dismissal claim if the employee is dismissed. I think this really raises that the arguments in relation to separability again. Are the circumstances that we're dealing with here, are they such that an exceptional argument could be made that um, to separate out the claim and the employees protected disclosures that they're making um, from the manner in which they're making them? So in other words, could it be argued that the employer has um, reasonable grounds for saying, well, actually, I've told you that these um, alleged protected disclosures have no substance. Um, I have demonstrated to you why there are no COVID, why the COVID-19 um, health and safety concern that you are raising is not a valid one, and yet you keep on repeating it, making these allegations, you keep on saying that you're making protected disclosures about this, presumably for your own gain. Now, it seems to me that if, in those circumstances, if the employee has repeated the allegations sufficiently um, and made a sufficient number of protected disclosures, um, potential vexatious protected disclosures, then it could be argued that um, the employer may take action. But I do say it's got to be the stage where the employee is acting vexatiously or unreasonably, as Mr. Paniatu was, because otherwise there is a clear causal link between the protected disclosure and um, any action being taken against them under the disciplinary be that dismissal or a detriment because it seems to me of course we must remember when it comes to protective disclosures that the employee it doesn't actually what the employee is um, making a disclosure about doesn't need to necessarily be true the claimant just need the employee just needs to reasonably believe and disclose information that tends to suggest one of those um, statutory grounds so um, it's got to be a very high um, threshold it seems to me for uh, employer to be able to take disciplinary action in those circumstances and to persuade a tribunal that the employee was acting vexatiously or unreasonably and that they, there was no grounds essentially that the employee could reasonably believe that those facts tended to show one of the um, matters alleged. So um, my practical advice on that is I know it's painful but I think in it um, until you get to a stage where you can reasonably argue that, that the employee or the worker is acting vexatiously or unreasonably, do not discipline for something arising out of a protected, what is a protected disclosure. Take my, 
my earlier advice, which is deal with the protected disclosure, um, provide a, a paper trail why it's not correct, document your actions, and then should it go further, you will have the evidence to deal with it. Now, um, I see I've also got some questions about office holders and whether they amount to workers. So directors, for example, and um, NED, so non-executive directors, a lot of that is going to depend on the contractual relationship um, between the um, individual and the respondent. It seems to me that if you had a situation where a director is engaged under um, a particular contract of services that could amount to being a worker, then yes, you could, the, the director in those circumstances might have um, protection and be able to whistleblow. Um, I thought it's less likely in relation to a NED, but again, we'd have to look at the actual contractual relationship between the NED and the company. Um, could there potentially be an argument there arising out of Gillum as well to say, well, I may be an office holder, I may not have the necessary contractual um, relationship to say that I'm a worker under section um, 233, but um, because of the role of, because of my particular role as a director, um, it would essentially be a, sta a, a status discrimination not to um, be able to blow the whistle and not to be protected. Those are arguments that we may see developed in the future, but at the moment, look at the um, contractual relationship um, and see whether there is sufficient there on the facts of it to say that this individual was a worker. I covered that question. A question about whether it's likely, talking about the no job, no jab, um, it's more likely that an employer would be able to mandate vaccines in a workplace where social distancing is not possible. Maybe in the future, but still, I don't think so at the moment partly because, as I said, the, the practical point. At the moment, it's not like the flu jab, uh, where employers actually have access to the vaccines and are able to provide them. Um, so perhaps in the future, when we are at those circumstances, we might be able to be able to have those um, policies put in place. But I don't think it's practical at the moment. I think any protected disclosure that arise, arose out of uh, an employer trying to enforce, um, at this stage, their employees to take the vaccine would um, is likely to succeed because it might potentially be, as I said, indirectly discriminatory against different groups for different reasons. Uh, I am very mindful of the fact that I'm afraid I have now run out of time. Thank you very, very much for joining me on this webinar. And thank you for your interesting questions. I hope it's been useful um, to you all. I certainly think it's very useful at this time, given um, the COVID pandemic and the increase in these claims and the usefulness of these claims that we refresh our memory of them. So thanks for your time. I'm going to end the webinar now and I look forward to speaking to you all again soon. Take care. Bye.